Yeah, I mean, well, I think Chad is a good example of that because after Chad basically broke their deal with the World Bank, they've been getting increasing amounts of Chinese oil investment. So it's sort of exactly this issue that um, um, folks like Debbie are sort of very natural uh, allies for lenders or donors or investors who don't care very much about human rights standards or democracy. So I think one of the differences, you know, I don't want to make any sort of moral points. You know, the U.S. foreign policy is, is, is pretty often indifferent to the consequences of what happens to people on the ground. Not always, but, but often. Um, but the difference is because the U.S. is a democracy, there are voices pressuring the U.S. government to take into account human rights standards and democracy in its operation abroad. So USAID faces those pressures, whereas Chinese uh, investors and Chinese government aid agencies, because China is, an China is an authoritarian dictatorship, don't face those pressures. You know, you can't protest in China to make sure Chinese, um, you know, foreign aid only goes to democracies when China isn't a democracy. It doesn't make any sense. So let me take one more point on this issue and then we'll move on. Yeah. So how are democracies dealing with industrialization policy? Explain a little bit more how you're linking that to say the, the natural resource exports. No, there is. There is, there is manufacturing. I mean, not as much as we'd like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, it's being sold. So, you know, in defense of anybody who's buying these commodities, like, they're getting paid for it. They're getting paid the world price, which is very high for these commodities. So I, I feel like one thing I don't want the, the conversation to turn into is some notion that Chinese firms or what are stealing resources from Africa. They're not. They're paying the world price. And, and you know, the counter argument to all this, which we haven't made so far, but this is what the Chinese foreign ministry says, and there's something to it, is to say, we respect the sovereignty of other countries. If they're dictatorships, we respect them. If they're democracies, we respect them. We deal with them. We buy, we sell, we're doing business with them. And we don't dictate to them in some sort of, you know, condescending way what their political institutions should be. And so there is something to that. You know, the, you know, the, the fear a little bit with Western governments' uh, attempts to, you know, push democracy and promote human rights in Sub-Saharan Africa, even if we believe in those goals, is, um, it's a bit patronizing, and it may violate the sovereignty of those nations to determine their own fate. That's one view. The counter view to that is, if there's an authoritarian, di authoritarian dictatorship in an African country, people aren't allowed to express their views. Um, so uh, why should we respect the views of one dictator you know, when, when he doesn't have legitimacy? So it's a complicated issue, but, but, um, but a lot of African countries' growth, all the spectacular growth we've seen in the last 10 years has come from purchases of these commodities on international markets. So there clearly are benefits in the aggregate. The big question, just to circle back to what people have been circling around out here, is who's going to benefit from those income gains? And is it going to be concentrated in the hands of a few, or will these increased revenues end up leading to public investment or other things that could benefit the many? So uh, just a I know you weren't, I set up a straw man in response to your point. I know you weren't saying that literally, but I, I just wanted to, to, to clarify that. Now, back to manufacturing. In what's called industrial policy or sort of manufacturing policy is something that is on the agenda in many countries. In the case of Ghana, it is as well. Ghana's had a lot of growth, and you know, there's a fear when there are natural resource fines of what's called Dutch disease, which people may be familiar with, which is typically when there's a big increase in uh, natural resource exports, it leads to an appreciation of the currency. And that appreciation of the local currency could make uh, manufacturing less competitive. That appreciation effectively raises the effective price of labor locally. So it's a real fear. Even if you have these great oil funds, even if you manage them well, that it's going to sort of crowd out your development in other areas. And this is one of the big concerns, David. Well, kind of on that point, how does like, the fact that China, China is basically the potential direction they're going to play a large, large factor in the United States, especially in the manufacturing of China's industrial industry, they're going to be a potential direction they're going to be a potential direction. Yeah, again, it's a distributional issue. So to the extent that what you call currency manipulation or sort of having a devalued currency, um, to the extent that it makes Chinese goods cheaper, consumers all over the world benefit from those cheap goods. If you're an industrial worker in Ghana or Kenya or South Africa, you're less happy about that. So there's sort of winners and losers from that policy, but it certainly isn't going to help industrial development in Sub-Saharan Africa for sure. So your point is, is right, but on the flip side, you could say, well, China's giving away all these goods for free. That's great. You know, consumers are benefiting. These great shoes I'm wearing, you know, half the price. Okay, any last comments or thoughts? This is obviously a complex issue. We're just starting to get into it. Later in the term, we're going to get back to 4 and 8 debates. We're going to get back to some of this. But okay, last, last word on this topic. K is the same at baseline. The assumption was K was the same in 1980. Over time, K is going to be a lot larger. You know, when A increases, K star moves all the way to the right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're thinking of human capital versus physical capital. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's, that's an interesting point. And I think you know a richer version of the model would work that out. And you know it's certainly the case that um, you know literacy rates in China in 1980 were reasonably high. So you know some human capital measures were pretty good in contrast to many African countries. So what I want to do next is come back to the same clicker question we had last time. I want you guys to answer it again, and we'll compare your answers. So I asked you to sort of think about this question before, um, before we had this whole discussion about the effect of Asian growth on Sub-Saharan Africa. And I know it's tricky because you know, now in the discussion we've talked about effects of Asian growth in the 80s on Africa, and now effects going forward, the increase in X, all this stuff that's going on. But I just want you to rethink, like, on net, has all the economic reform and all the economic growth in Asia, especially China and Africa, tended to promote growth overall, like, as of today? Is Sub-Saharan Africa richer or poorer today because of the past few decades of Asian growth? So I want you guys to click in now. Wow, that's fast. Is that possible? Well, I guess there's a lot of different people, right? Let's just one person. Okay, let's go to just one minute if you want to, you know, meditate. I guess most people have clicked in. And then I'll show you the percentages from this time and last time. So this will be an illustration of how class discussion shifts your views. Either that or it's just pure noise. I'm not sure. Okay, last few seconds here to make your voice heard. I'll stop at one minute. I think everybody's clicked in. Okay, so what does it look like? So we have 74% saying Asian growth has tended to promote, 21% hindered, 4% sort of no effect. Okay, so 74 and 21. And last time it was 64 and 26. So actually the discussion shifted people's views a little bit towards thinking that Asian growth is actually on net promoted African, African growth relative to what you guys thought before. 
Okay, so let's, let's transition a little bit. We've been thinking about the growth framework. I want to get into some of the details about A and K. And at various points in the next few weeks, we will circle back to trying to classify things as A factors and K factors. Um, and I want to turn to geography. So one of the readings I'm reading this is this Blumen Sachs article from 98, which makes this bold claim. At the root of Africa's poverty lies its extraordinarily disadvantageous geography, which has helped to shape its societies and its interactions with the rest of the world. So they kind of just lay it out for you there. They are really going to put their finger on geography as a sort of curse facing sub-Saharan Africa relative to other regions. Now, what do they mean when they talk about this disadvantageous geography? Well, they start out by, by pointing out a couple interesting patterns in the data. And this goes beyond sub-Saharan Africa. It's, it's global. And they say, you know, this is PPP per capita income back in 95. So you have to inflate all this up. And they say, look, worldwide, tropical regions are just much poorer than non-tropical regions. So on average, non-tropical regions of the world are three times richer than tropical regions. So the fact that sub-Saharan Africa, for the most part, lies in the tropics just as a starting point uh, gives it a disadvantage. You know, it goes beyond just looking across countries. Even within countries, the tropical subregions of countries tend to be poorer than the non-tropical subregions. You know, northern Brazil is much poorer than southern Brazil. Traditionally, the southern United States, which isn't quite, which isn't quite tropical, but sort of subtropical in some areas, the southern United States was a lot poorer than the northern United States. Southern Europe was a lot poorer than northern Europe. The southern parts of South America are a lot richer than the northern parts of South America. And you can just sort of go on and on and on. But around the world, there's this incredible pattern. And the same sort of pattern holds within Sub-Saharan Africa. So if you look at the bits of Sub-Saharan Africa that are non-tropical, mainly South Africa and bits of other countries at the sort of southernmost point in Sub-Saharan Africa, they're also about three times richer than tropical Africa. So it's kind of the same pattern wherever you go. And then the question is why, and that's really what Blumen Sachs is all about, is trying to make sense of that. But you know, if we put up our world map and we draw lines at the tropics, which are the red lines there, you see that you know, the pattern that we were, we were pointing out before, um, that you know, with the exception of South Africa and little bits of, of neighboring countries, all of Sub-Saharan Africa is in the tropics. And um, you know, tropical areas are poor. Mexico is the same. The border regions of Mexico with the U.S. are richer than the extreme south of Mexico and on and on. You see the same sort of pattern again and again and again. So what is going on? Why are these tropical areas so poor? They propose three channels. So first they discuss agricultural productivity in Africa. Then they discuss tropical disease. And, and then they discuss transport costs and sort of the importance of that for development. So those are three main channels that can help explain why tropical regions, and in particular tropical Africa, is so poor. And we're going to have our second clicker question, which is just, again, ex ante, before we get into the details, which of those three factors do you feel is likely to be most important in slowing African growth over the last few um, decades, and then I put choice D on there, maybe you think they're all kind of roughly equally important. Yeah. Let's, let's think of disease excluding HIV here, but it's a good question. Okay, 10 more seconds to think. I think there's two more people I need to answer. Where are you? I can see it in your eyes. Oh, there you are. Okay, perfect. So what did we find? Okay, so it's, it's pretty evenly spread, which is good. A lot of people think it's agriculture, a lot of people think it's disease, transport costs, and all of them. So, you know, they're sort of all, I think part of the reason I put this on is I think they're all kind of ex-ante, pretty plausible, plausibly important. It seems like, you know, there's, there's very, you know, folks who have, have each of these views in the class. Let's start with agriculture. We're going to go through these in turn. Their basic claim, which has been, you know, shown to be true by many researchers, is that yields per acre are much lower in sub-Saharan Africa than most other developing regions of the world. If you look at the yield of the same crop, it could be rice, it could be corn, it could be sorghum, yields are lower. And not lower by like 5%, but much lower in many cases. And the question is, why are yields so low? And they point to a number of different factors. I want to start with rainfall, um, because it's so central to their story, and it's something that we're going to talk about at different points throughout the term uh, as well. So a couple things. First, on average, their claim is sub-Saharan Africa gets less rainfall than other regions. And that's, that's bad. Now, of course, if you have like, extreme flooding, that's bad. But over a sort of reasonable range, getting more rainfall may allow you to have a second crop cycle per year. Uh, more soil moisture opens up different possibilities in terms of different crops. <coughs> so low rainfall is part of the problem. But beyond that, and this gets back to the question before about volatility, sub-Saharan Africa has more variable rainfall. So sub-Saharan African countries are much more likely to have a drought, a severe drought in a given year, than countries in other regions of the world. Now, it kind of makes sense. If you have low rainfall to start with, then you know, variation around your already low mean is going to be more likely to push you into a drought sort of risk uh, range. So what does this data look like? I actually downloaded the data. And I, I focused on the data through 2000 just because I think it'll help us think about the, you know, the, the period of low growth um, a bit. I got the, the rainfall data for all sub-Saharan African, Latin American, and Asian countries and plotted out the distribution of annual rainfall in millimeters. And this is what you see. So the red line there is sub-Saharan Africa, the green is Latin America, the blue is Asia. You can see sub-Saharan Africa, does, you know, the distribution has definitely shifted to the left relative to Latin America, and Asia on average has more rainfall. Now, there's a lot of variation. There certainly are you know, country years of data, both in Latin America and Asia, where there's low rainfall. But there's a lot higher density in Africa at those very low rainfall levels. You know, if we were to draw a line at about 500 millimeters, you could see there's a lot of mass to the left of that line in the African distribution, and really not that much in the Asian or Latin American distribution. And you know, if we were to sort of look at that, the total density, it's, it's a non-trivial share of all country year observations in the data. So you know, each data point that's going into these densities is the amount of rainfall in a particular country on average in a given year. So that shaded region says there's a lot of observations where sub really very dry observations in sub-Saharan Africa relative to other regions. And they illustrate this uh, using information on drought. And they say, well, of the 42 sub-Saharan African countries <coughs> that they have data for, more than half of them had had at least two years of extreme drought in the previous 12 years. 14 of them, so a third of them, had at least three years of extreme drought. That's a lot. Three years of extreme drought in 12 years means one out of every four years for those countries that were having an extreme drought. That's, a very, that's very difficult to deal with. If you're a poor country, that doesn't, you know, you're a poor household, you don't have much in the way of savings or assets. If you're being hit by drought year after drought year, you really don't have any assets left to deal with. Now, there's an article you guys might be interested in that I was going to put on the reader, and I didn't, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Um, this this uh, Barrios, Bertinelli, and Strobel article that came out a few years ago in the Review of Economics and Statistics. And so what they do is two things. First, they get the best possible rainfall data. It's a little bit like the data I put together for a similar, for similar period, although uh, they go back farther in time. They put together rainfall data for, Latin, for uh, Sub-Saharan African countries and also for Latin American and Asian countries. And they look at how rainfall levels year to year 
diverged from long-run averages. So they get data over, say, 50 years, so they know the average rainfall level in all these different countries. And then in any given year, they construct a deviation from that average to get a sense of how much of a sort of rainfall shock that country experienced. And they do that for African countries, and they do it for non-African countries. And they find something really interesting. They find that the 1980s, which is sort of the period that Blumen Sachs focused on when they talk about all these extreme droughts, were just an extremely dry period in Sub-Saharan Africa. And they end up, and what they do next is they correlate that rainfall with economic growth rates year to year in those African countries. And they find a very strong correlation. So let me show you the data quickly. So what is this line here? We have on the horizontal axis is, oh, well, actually, they went all the way back to 1900. Sorry, so this is one of the contributions of the paper, sort of stringing all this together. They go from 1900 to 2000. The line you see there, or the point zero, is average rainfall in Sub-Saharan Africa over this century. It's sort of like the you know, typical average mean rainfall year. And the black line there is, in a given year, how much rainfall in Sub-Saharan Africa deviated from that long-run average. So there's a couple things you see here. First, there's a lot of variability here. You see a lot of years where rainfall is 20 or 30% below, 30-something 30, 30 percent, 40 percent above. But the, the, sort of, the, the sort of time period that's most striking is this transition from pretty good rainfall in the 60s and 70s, remember when African growth was pretty good, to this absolute collapse in rainfall in the 1980s, where you go from being, you know, for about 10 years there, you're kind of above zero, you're at 0.1, 0.2, meaning 10 to 20 percent more rainfall than the historical average, down to minus 40 percent below mean rainfall. So you have a drop of like half in rainfall levels. And it actually stays below zero in the 90s. So this low growth decade in the 90s was also a low rainfall decade. So you know, I sh remember we, we looked at per capita income in Africa in the 60s and 70s, it kind of was going up, and then it went down in the 80s and 90s, and it kind of recovered. It looks a little bit like the time pattern, right, from 1960 to 2000 uh, here. And I'll show you that, that correlation in a second. But, but just the extreme nature of the droughts of the 1980s really come through in this, in this figure. Let me pause for a second and see if people have questions or comments on this figure. Yeah. They didn't put it together, and I don't have it here. So you'll have to wait till later if I manage to get that data. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was better than the 80s. But that looks like a real bad time. Yeah. Great. So let's look at the Asian and Latin American average. You guys are great. I mean, I, you just follow instructions so beautifully. Um, so this is the Latin American. This is the developing country non-Africa sample. It's a mixture of Latin American Asia. It's not perfect, but um, so you see, there's certainly variability. So actually, there was a big drop in rainfall here uh, in, in the late 20s. But you know, the, the 70s, 80s, and 90s don't have any extreme deviations from zero. You know, plus or minus 10 percent or something here. Nothing like the sort of effects we saw in Sub-Saharan Africa in the 80s. So um, you know, part of this is we are smoothing over more countries. That's going to tend to smooth things out. But there were no major anomalies. No major like weather or climatic anomalies in other regions here. And if anything, in much of the 80s and 90s, at least that, there's that little you know spike in the 80s above zero rather than sort of collapsing. Yeah. This here, I think they use the country averages. I don't think they do weight. I'll have to check what they say in the notes. It would be more um, probably appropriate if we're thinking about this in terms of how it affects living standards for human beings to potentially weight by population, but I don't think they're doing that. Um, I have to read through the notes of their tables again to make sure. Okay, so what's the next sort of step here? Then what these guys do is they correlate rainfall levels in Africa with growth levels. So this figure's a little hard to read. The solid line is the rainfall, and the rainfall is measured on the axis on the left, <coughs> where they kind of normalize these anomalies. The scale is a little different. And the dashed line is the GDP per capita um, growth. And what they're saying here is when you know, rainfall is below trend, growth is low, and when rainfall sort of goes back up the trend, growth goes back up the trend. This is not shocking given how important agriculture is in African economies. So the vast majority of workers in almost all sub-Saharan African countries work in agriculture. A very large share of total production is in agriculture, and there's very little irrigation in sub-Saharan Africa. Most agriculture is rain-fed agriculture. So when there's bad rain, there's bad crops, and people are poor. So it makes perfect sense these things would sort of go together. But it does mean that to the extent that sub-Saharan Africa has very volatile weather shocks all the time, it leads to volatility in the economy. And that's a fundamental issue that African countries need to face. Yeah. Did you say there was a prediction there would be a drought? Or? Okay, I don't know. Do you know what the source is? Or do you remember where you read that? Oh, okay. Um, I, you know, I think there's certainly predictions with climate change that there will be more drought, for sure. In terms of like from this year to next year, it's, it's often hard to predict. But it's certainly the case that, and, and we'll come back to it in a few weeks, that the, the climate models that are out there predict warming, warmer temperatures, and changes in rainfall patterns that will increase drought risk in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa. So that would suggest if these sorts of patterns continue to remain the case going forward, that would suggest that in areas where there is drought, there will be economic, serious economic consequences, for sure, yes. So I think the implication of what you're saying is that's very important going forward in thinking about African economic growth. Yeah. There's some, but I think a lot less than you might want once you see patterns like this. And that's something that a number of us who've been studying African development have been thinking about or saying or writing about for a number of years, which is there seems to be too little of this sort of investment. Because irrigation investments don't only improve productivity in good years, they do. Good irrigation can improve your farming productivity even when you have good rainfall. But they, irrigation can serve a sort of insurance role to the extent that you can sort of store water and use it later in periods where there isn't as much rainfall. It can help you smooth out some of this variability. So you know, it does seem like a natural investment. Yeah. So in case people can hear that, the question was, is there a correlation between these sorts of rainfall shocks and civil conflict? And we will get to that in a few weeks, that 